Dick Cheney and his minions have brought, and uh, Richard Pearl is one of his minions, and Doug Fyth is one of his minions, have brought the art of lying to a new scale, a new level. Was oil the number one influence on President Bush and, Pre and Vice President Cheney? Or was WMD? Or was spreading democracy? And don't believe it for a moment. They didn't even think about spreading democracy when they started this war. They transmogrified the mission into starting or, or democracy simply to appease the American people and to give them some reason to support the war. Um, you, you have to decide where were these factors. And uh, inevitably, the Jewish lobby in America, APEC in particular, the focus lobby, has got to be there. You're being naive if you don't put that factor up there as an influence on national security decision making, particularly with the Bush administration. The APAC lobby is very influential through Vice President Cheney, very influential, and through people like Elliot Abrams, Paul Wolfowitz, and a host of others within the government. And of course, you don't want to lose sight of the fact that the Israeli government was also feeding the United States government intelligence which said that Iraq had a serious WMD capability and was an imminent threat. There's an Israeli general named Shlomo Brahm who has written a piece on this which says, in effect, that Israel was a full partner in this scheme to convince the public in the United States and around the globe that Iraq was an imminent threat. Iraq was not an imminent threat. The fact is that even if Saddam had had nuclear weapons, there was nothing he could do with them, right? But you could not make those arguments at the time in the United States. It was very, very hard to get them out into the public domain uh, and for them to get any traction. Do you agree with Mersheimer and Walt that the influence of the pro-Israel lobby was important for going to war with Iraq? I do, but I would not have presented it the way they did because I think that they underestimate ideas and they underestimate, if you like, emotions. They're very cold and realistic in their view of politics. And for them, since the Going to war with Iraq is absolutely crazy, and it was pretty obviously crazy for many of us before. It must have been, there must have been some pressure to do something so irrational. And of course there was, but they underestimate other factors. The illusion, for example, that we could have control of Iraq's oil and of the strategic region. The belief, which is a deep American belief, which was not invented by the Jewish lobby, that America knows how to, knows how democracy should work and is an example to the world and has a moral duty and certainly a right to bring this example to the world. And it's all mixed together. So ideals, belief about American exceptionalism, American duties, American provincialism, not knowing about what's going on outside, and Israeli pressure, yes the suggestion that um, uh, that the Israeli lobby, as he describes it, is in effect um, operated by the Israelis and reflects Israeli preferences is simply wrong and can be shown to be wrong. So, and you, so you don't feel part of Israeli lobby? No, I'm not part of uh, an Israeli lobby. Uh, I have my own views. Uh, I'm sympathetic to Israel, as most Americans are sympathetic to Israel. I'm not incapable of being critical of an Israeli policy that I don't like. Uh, but the main point is that, that it is not the Israeli government that shapes the thinking of uh, Americans who are pro-Israeli. Richard Pearl would probably say in response to your question, if you got the truth out of them, Israel's interests and America's interests are the same. And so if I'm an advocate for Israel's interest, I'm an advocate for America's interest. And I would say back to them, again as a strategist, bullshit. <laughs> no two countries in history and no, co no two countries in the future in history, I will predict, will ever have coincidental national interest all the time. No way.
Now, I don't want to kind of develop this great sense of victimhood, but I do feel, and it's, you know, I, I come here and I, I feel that we in Israel have paid the price. Daniel Levy diende in het Israëlische leger en was voor Israël onderhandelaar bij de vredesbesprekingen in Genève, Oslo 2 en Taba. Hij werkt nu in Washington en heeft zich ten doel gesteld een ander Joods geluid te laten horen. American Jews, surprise, surprise, are liberal Democrats when it comes to most issues, including the Middle East. So when you poll American Jews, they're for the peace process and they're for American engagement and they're for a two-state solution. And we did the Geneva Initiative and they were in favor of that as well. But the institutional organized leadership of the community has kind of taken things in a very different direction. And I do feel that for their own reasons, reasons that I understand, reasons that are not unique to the Jewish diaspora in America, reasons that are prevalent in many diaspora politics around the world. It's to do with my identity in a diaspora, it's to do partially with guilt, it's to do with my own political role in my new host community, etc., etc. They've driven so-called pro-Israel politics in Washington in a direction which is directly antithetical to what is good for Israel. In that respect, yes, I do feel we paid a price. Of course, that has been increased many fold under the current administration. America has become part of the Israeli victim narrative. It began, I think, in the 70s, when one of the ways in which the African-American community could begin to get amends for slavery and the consequences of slavery was by emphasizing that it was a, it was a victim of history, that even if you or you didn't do it, history did it. Your grandparents did it. It's not a personal responsibility, but as a cultural debt. And the Holocaust, of course, is the ultimate victim narrative. And David Ben-Gurion, the first Israeli prime minister, knew this very well because he turned it to advantage giving the Israel as a whole country a victim narrative. If you can't criticize someone because he himself is a victim, what do you do with a whole country, which is a country born of victimhood, so to speak? I have been in conversations many times with people who are very reasonable and would say, yes, you're right, Israel does do bad things. The Occupy territories, stealing the water, stealing the land, bombing the houses, etc. But remember what happened to the Jews. There is a background, there is a history, there is a reason, there is an excuse for this. And of course, you know, you can say the same thing for the Palestinians. Remember what happened to the Palestinians after the Nakba in 1948 and so on, 1967. No wonder they have suicide bombers. You can always do this. There's always a relationship between collective past suffering and present individual actions. To turn that into public policy, though, is catastrophic. And that is what we see today.